Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Joe Kwan. Joe works for KPMG and on the side is known as the Connection Counselor, (laughs) doing leadership uh, leadership coaching and uh, really passionate about leadership. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to my podcast, Joe. Hi, Jono. Thanks so much for asking me on. I uh, really enjoy your kind of natural and exploratory style, so was super excited to be invited onto your podcast today. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. First of all, can you tell our listeners about the different hats you wear, what you, what you do at KPMG, what you do uh, with your own work on the side, like I mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. Would love to. Um, so been with KPMG for 15 years, uh, a lawyer by training. Um, most of what I've done in my career uh, is on the regulatory side and just helping the organization stay on the right side uh, of the regulators. Um, I'd say in more recent time, let's say the past three to five years, I've become more interested in uh, leadership training and coaching, um, presenting as well. Um, so a few years ago, I started uh, a side hustle, uh, the Connection Counselor, uh, where I deliver uh, various leadership content as well as coaching. And that has been uh, tremendous for me personally, as well as for my career, because uh, as they say, I have to eat my own dog food and <laughs> anything I'm willing to tell clients, <laughs> I have to uh, apply to my own uh, career and life. So it's it's been a great journey so far. Yeah, isn't that hard when you actually... <laughs> I know for me, one of the best things about working for others and coaching others is how often, well, and even this podcast is how often I think, hmm, or I'm at a whiteboard doing something and I go, hmm, <laughs> you know, I'm actually, I might be doing this process really well for this client, but it's, I stop, you know, regularly and think, wait a second, I, I definitely uh, am not doing this particular area of what I'm doing as well as, as how I'm talking about it. And I find that is a consistent challenge and it's it is the beauty of having your own uh, having your own business your own interest something that you're growing because you you certainly do find the rubber hits the road with all those uh, cliches or or and as well just true foundational principles that that are simple but hard work to live out well you know what i find kind of funny jano as well sometimes um you know months or years later someone will come up to me and say hey joe I applied that advice you told me about, and it was really great. And I, I'll be scratching my head and not remember at all <laughs> the advice that I gave them in the conversation. I'm like, that's really great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's so good. Well, I always love hearing people's stories. Tell us about some of the moments that really shaped you becoming the person and the leader you are, even as far back as childhood. What what are some of those moments for you, Joe? Yeah, so um, for me, I think from a, you know, from childhood, I was always just very interested in people um, and very social uh, in that way. Um, and as I got older, there were a couple of things that happened that helped me kind of understand the principles of that um, a little bit better. And, you know, one kind of thing that really helped me a lot, and I think this can apply to anyone, is when you learn something kind of deeply and there's like a framework to learn something, um, you can actually apply those principles to interpersonal relationships or anything else because the principles themselves are universal. So for some people, it may be an instrument. For other people, it may be um, a sport or acting. Um, for me, it happened to be a training in a martial art called Aikido. And it's very much based on energy and, and flows of energy, which is, you know, very, um, you know, people are really in tune with that more these days. Um, and the thing that was interesting to me is every kind of physical movement or principle can be a metaphor or translated into how you might think about your relationship or connection uh, with a person. Um, so what I found a lot that's been helpful for me personally, as well as in my coaching, when I get stuck, try to think about in a physical space what that problem would be. And if you can solve it physically, it can actually lead to insights into how you might solve it in a more abstract, interpersonal way. Yeah, I love that. That's really interesting. Can you give us any examples of how you've been able to do that or how you've been able to work with clients to, to use that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question, Jono. Um, so there's this principle called taking out the slack, um, which basically means when you have a hold of someone, um, there's a certain uh, amount of looseness between the two of you. And to truly connect with the person, you have to take out the slack. It's almost like a rubber band, right? Like when a rubber band's too loose, it's not really doing its job. But when it's too tight, 
it's actually not good either. There's like that kind of optimal moment where you wrap the rubber band around something and it's like exactly at the right tension. Um, that's kind of the principle of taking out the slack. And you could apply this just to, let's just say a conversation, let's keep it simple with someone. If you come on and you're sort of too aggressive in the conversation or you want something from your boss or a coworker and you're just so pushy about it, it's like that rubber band is too tight and it's going to snap or it hurts people so it feels unpleasant. They don't want to be around you. Versus the opposite where it's too loose and you're not putting in enough energy and maybe they don't, they don't even realize you're there or you want something but you're not speaking up or putting enough emphasis into what you're saying so that's not effective. Ideally, um, you're at that sort of optimal amount of attention, of engagement, of presence where both of you can be connected and when you say something they're like okay I understand what you're saying and they say something back and because you're also you know engaged and have taken out the slack you understand exactly where they're coming from um, and that has really helped me tremendously in terms of kind of communication both with clients as well as uh, at work making sure that you stay connected with people um, because sometimes we think we're connected but we're we're not really yeah, I, I love that um, idea of the rubber band. That's that's really cool. Uh, so for you, you 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 grew up. You had this uh, really great um, physical <laughs> metaphor from your training in this martial art that that was teaching you lessons. You were learning some really great lessons, like you've just mentioned, um, that uh, that have applied for your whole life. Do you remember your first moment where you thought, "Wow, maybe I am a leader." Or was that something that, or maybe I can really influence people. Was that something for you that you always knew about yourself? Um, I would say it's something I always knew about myself kind of reluctantly. <laughs> it was one of these things where others would often kind of nominate me um, to do things. And I wasn't quite sure why, um, but it would keep on happening over and over again. So um, I think for me, part of it was just kind of embracing that. And I don't know if it was a confidence thing or um, just maybe, I don't know, not being ready for it yet. Um, but, you know, once I, and I think it happened in a recent job transition where I changed jobs a few times um, over the course of a few years. And it really kind of reset things for me and made me think a little bit more consciously about what I was doing with my career and relationships. And I just decided, you know, in that in that moment of change, you know what, I'm going to try some different things. I'm going to try to be more engaged in certain ways, take more risks, and started to really see um, the fruits of that and, and kind of the power that we each have um, when we engage, you know, with our organizations in the world in a certain way. Um, and then since then, it's, it's just been um, amazing, amazing just to be able to um, sort of harness that uh, ability, which yeah. before I think I had been somewhat reluctant to. What is it that helped you overcome that in this recent transition? Hmm, that's a that is a good question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I do remember prior to that happening. There were periods in my career where, you know, things weren't going so great. Um, not so much in terms of my performance or the way I was being evaluated, but maybe just in terms of um, of my own kind of motivation and, and attitude. Um, you know, imposter syndrome, which, which people talk about, um, would creep up every now and then. Um, and just, I guess it was just a moment where I realized that if I kind of owned up to maybe the self-reflection of some of the things that were holding me back, um, that, I, that, that that was really where I needed to go because what I was doing in the past was um, maybe externally people who supported me, like my family and, and my amazing wife, Heather, you know, they would kind of advocate on my behalf and try to make me see like, yeah, you know, you can do all these things and you're great at this. But we can really argue ourselves out of things pretty well. Um, and then even when I was trying to do it for myself, um, it was almost like when you're arguing with yourself, but you can't really win. 
because you know all the counters to your to your own <laughs> arguments. Um, yeah. So there was a period where I kind of realized, well, let me dig a little bit deeper and, and like, why, what am I afraid of? Like, what is the fear? What is the thing that's holding me back? Um, and I won't go into this, um, you know, on, on this call, but, you know, it, it took a while. But once I was able to kind of get through that briar patch, it, it really knocked something loose um, where I was able to, you know, have that genuine confidence and comfort level with myself, whereas before... Um, I didn't really have it. And we're talking like into my 40s. So, uh, I mean, I wish yeah. this had happened like when I was 20 or something. <laughs> it would have been phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it's funny like that, isn't it? I, I It really resonates with me what, what you're talking about. For me in my journey, I think it's uh, when, when I started out, even if, I, even if I said it one way, what I really believed is that the best leaders, great leaders uh, were you know, really smart, really, really smart people who tended to get it right most of the time. And people might hear that and go, well, yeah, that not that true? And what I've learned as I spend more and more time with leaders that I think has really helped me to overcome some of that imposter syndrome is, is the greatest mm-hmm. leaders actually fill the room, fill their team with people smarter than them. Um, and they actually are the most self-aware of their limitations and their weaknesses. And they, they use that as a way to say, uh, you know, as a way to practice humility and own up to their mistakes. But the biggest, most glaring mistakes that, that ruin careers, that ruin businesses, that, um, that cost, have incredibly high costs are usually some, there's some connection to pride. There's usually some lack of communication because of a blind spot. And, uh, and that for me has been a big aha moment because I go, well, you know what? I can't be the smartest person in every room. What a relief to know that actually, if I want to be a really great leader, I need to lead in such a way that I can find and keep really smart, humble people around me and become more and more self-aware of my own limitations realize my own mistakes, find out what it's really like to work for me. Those are all things that you can, anyone can do. And that's why I love this idea that leaders, you know, sometimes we think leaders are, are, are born. And in my opinion, I believe so much of leadership, even the emotional intelligence can be learned. Um, but it requires that willingness and humility to look in the mirror. And like you said, to to stop in the middle of some of those arguments where you already know the answers and to get outside help and to find out, to do 360 degree feedback, to, to go, okay, let me have it. What's it really like to work for me? Um, and I think most people who have nightmare stories of leaders, it's because their leaders didn't do those things. They were threatened by people who were smarter than them and uh, leaders that are really, that, that, that make big messes behind them and, are, and actually don't treat people well tend to have big areas where they're blind spots because they just aren't willing to face some of those hard things about themselves. Yeah, isn't that funny, Jono? What what you're saying really resonates with me so much because, you know, you mentioned the smarts and then the ability to do things and know things the right way. And, And what I'm hearing from you, and it resonates with me so much, is the best leaders I've had, they've they've been able to do one of two things and hopefully both. Um, and the one that, you know, you're kind of pointing at is just that, like the, having that state of being and that confidence and that um, humility to sort of control themselves and manage themselves so they can um, manage others better and, and get the best out of people. So that's the one piece. Yeah. And then the other piece, which isn't always um, positive, this one is sort of, morally agnostic it's it's just getting stuff done right and you can get it done with a carrot you can get it done with a (laughs) stick but most leaders i know unless you know their dad or their mom owns the organization they get something done for someone and and it might not be getting money done it might be doing all the nasty tasks that that the current leader doesn't want to do It, it may be i don't know things that are too risky and, and this person's risk averse. So, so they keep you around. So you'll do the risky thing and, and expose your backside to those things. But you're getting something done for someone else and you're adding value that way. Not always a good thing. Sometimes that can be 
um, a bad thing, but I've noticed that most leaders have one or, or, or both of those, and hopefully in a moral kind of servant sort of way rather than, you know, taking care of number one sort of way. Yeah, I, I love uh, what you've said there about getting things done because it comes back to, I think there's something about that, once again, humility. I think humility is, is such a powerful trait because when it comes to getting mm-hmm. getting things done, you, you're right, the, the people that you want on your team are those people who go, you know what, um, this may not be my job description this may not be the perfect thing for me to go and do, or there may be no upside for me personally from doing this, but I'm just going to get in and do it because it's, it's bigger than me. And, um, and I think the, the other thing about getting things done is from my experience, so often what holds us back is we're scared of failure. And the problem is that you're, you know, you'll often have really smart people who in our whole education mm-hmm. system, what what's the goal? The goal is never to get a C plus. The goal is to get, you know, an, an, a, an A. And the problem is when everything's set up for people to get an A, it's, and then you realize in the real world and, and in business, you know, um, I love what Patrick Lencioni says about how it's, it's not about consensus, everyone agreeing. It's not about certainty that, you know, great leaders aren't 100% certain they're going to succeed. It's about clarity. If I can get clear and then move forward and then get clear and then move forward, um, that's, but that, that's hard to even trying to articulate it now. It's, it's tricky because uh, it's, but it's certainly, I agree, it's what I've seen leaders, leaders do. They, they find a way to get things done. That's also what great leaders do. And you see that even in countries and governments, they find a solution to move forward. Uh, that that's definitely a trait of a great leader. Yeah, what's what's interesting to me about um, what you're illuminating, Jono, about like you know the the system, right? That we're we're brought up in the system to be, uh, you know, in employees and that whole getting an A. I mean, if you think about any sort of business or or you know complicated task that you or I or any of your listeners have worked on, what is an A? Right? I mean, there are so many times where I've worked on a project where all these things went wrong, but we were able to get it done and no one really needed to be the wiser, right? Like all the things that needed to get done got done and all the things that went sideways weren't really fundamental to getting it done. And what happens? People are like, that was the most amazing training, conference, project, memo, whatever. And if you can just smile and be like, thank you. You know, thank you for that recognition. Then you don't need to be like, oh, but X, Y, and Z went wrong, and this could have been even better. And no one cares about that. You you delivered <laughs> the thing that needed to get done. It's only in your mind that you got a C. For everyone else, you got an A plus. <laughs> That's so true. It's I love that. Uh, you know, I play music, and um, I love it when you have a musician who comes off stage and they say. Oh man, did you you know? Did you notice that that note I played? You know, I really stuffed up that bit. And I love you know saying to people, it's like, well, you do realize no one, no one noticed. May maybe the people who noticed are those uh, few musicians who who would have heard that. Everyone else didn't even right. notice. And then and then the funny thing is, yeah. even when you stuff up so monumentally. I don't know about you, but if you think of it in this context, if we use that sort of metaphor of, of music and, and a performance, don't we love the performer who can stop and own it and go, you know what? Wow, that went wrong, didn't it? Man, that was that was so bad. Okay, let's try that bit over again. And and if you think about yourself in a crowd, you you are you know we're okay with that. And I think. I don't know what it looks like, but I think we need to get better at raising up leaders and building cultures and organizations where we go, you know what, go and give things a go, Um, go and try things, go and learn from them. Like I I just, I feel like we say all the right things, but our, our appetite for failure, particularly once an organization grows larger, it really struggles. And, um, and that's one of the beauty, that's one of the things about being an entrepreneur is so great because you're constantly pivoting and trying things and failing. It's what you have to do. But I think creating that culture, particularly in larger organizations, is really, really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's that expression? To err is human, 
right? I mean, <laughs> it's the first half of the expression, but like you're, if you're if you're perfect, you're you're not actually a human. You're some sort of robot or or algorithm that does exactly what it's programmed to do uh, every time. And I echo your statement that like you know, seeing someone mess up and handle it with grace uh, and and humility is one of the most kind of connecting kind of things you can do where people are like, wow, this is like a real person. I mean, there's very few people who are going to be like, oh, my gosh, you know, they're a horrible person for handling that gracefully with humility. I don't want to follow them or be friends with them. I mean, a person like that, they have their own issues. Yeah, that's that's right. And definitely if they're your boss, then uh, you want to think twice about where you're working. Um, it's one of my favorite stories someone told on this podcast, actually, they they uh, t- uh, they said there was this story of Warren Buffett, which I had never heard before, that when he was looking to put someone in charge of his biggest, most you know important uh, sort of portfolios or investments, or looking to put someone in a in a in a role, you know, looking at different candidates to lead one of these really big organizations, one criteria he always had was they they had to have made a big mistake somewhere else, because he wanted to oh. know how they handled that he's like i want their career to be far enough along that there's some sort of mistake that's you know worth noting and i want to i want to see how they responded and his point was everyone's going to make mistakes so i want to make sure i'm putting my most important assets in the hands of someone who's proven they can make a mistake and pick themselves up and handle it in terms of um, how they then go through that process of making it making it right in terms of how they uh, communicate with shareholders and stakeholders. And I was like, wow, that is so, I never would, I would not ordinarily be thinking like that. That's, that's a really interesting perspective. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And, and it resonates so much with what I've observed from leaders that I feel like I've learned a lot from and have a lot of respect for just watching how they handle the muck-ups, whether it was through something they could control or whether it was out of their control, just kind of like the demeanor, the problem-solving approach, the um, lack of sort of blame. Um, even if it is someone's fault, there's a there's a time to assess what happened and maybe who could have made a difference. But that time is usually not when you're doing triage, right? Like it, it does no good to say like so-and-so should have should have done this or this wouldn't have happened. They don't waste a second doing that they're like you know what let's get on with this how can we fix this how can we make this right what's the next thing we need to do very solution um oriented Mm. and it's not common i must say john like a lot of leaders they just lose it right when something doesn't go the way they want it to or they lose control they start throwing stuff they start yelling at people i've also seen people dress down in meetings Mm. it's really kind of horrible to witness um, but it's a pretty rare quality that someone can just really keep their cool. Um, you know, I love the word equanimity, you know, like they have that equanimity um, yeah. when something goes wrong, because that's when you can really see to Warren Buffett's wisdom, like how this person can lead is when mm. all the bad things happen. How do they lead? Not when everything's going right. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm interested to know for you in, in your career so far, are there any moments that spring to mind that were big wins of leadership where you either watched a leader do something where you were the leader where you were part of a team and just going through something or the way you navigated it was really memorable and and vice versa anything that comes to mind where uh as tim ferris asked people on his podcast favorite failures you know any moments where you go wow i I learned so much from that because as a team or personally i dropped the ball there and i really learned x y or z any any stories come to mind yeah, I have one story that encapsulates both of those, <laughs> failure and a win. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, there was a, a time I was managing a team. Um, I was new to the team. The team was established. Uh, they had all worked more years together than maybe I had worked yet in my career. Um, yet, you know, I was sort of assigned to be, you know, in, in charge of that team. Um, and initially it didn't really go that well like i didn't really gain the trust of the team um it was you know one of my earlier management experiences so i'm sure you know there were things that i was doing that weren't that great um either 
Um, so it got to the point where they were complaining, you know, over my head to my boss. And my boss was like, you know, Joe, if, if you don't fix this, maybe I should just have them report directly to me. And, you know, you can just sort of be an uh, individual contributor. Um, and that would have been fine, but I, I kind of took it as uh, if I took that route, I'm sort of giving up on my own leadership and sort of abdicating responsibility for, you know, fixing the part of the mess that I created. Um, so she said, you know, you need to have a meeting with your folks and, you know, straighten this out. So I have the meeting and, you know, I knew that if I had went in and just kind of like been myself and just kind of argued about what was going on or try to convince them why they should follow me, it would have been a bloodbath. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was actually luckily for me, it had been a few years since I had been mm. training in Aikido and I, I had started to learn a little bit about, you know, applying these principles. And, you know, the main thing I had learned that I applied in that meeting that I went into was the more I argue and push back or try to defeat kind of their attitude towards me, um, the more entrenched they're going to get. And there's, you know, several of them to one of me, right? So I'm always going to lose, right? Because they'll have more arguments and, and they'll have more instances. Yep. So uh, the principle that I ended up applying was um, instead of arguing, just try to kind of see things from their perspective, not necessarily agree unless you actually agree, but don't, don't argue, don't try to be smart, right? Like, like don't, don't try to like debate them into submission that you're a good leader because that obviously isn't working. Um, and so there's this moment that happens where when you kind of connect with people by accepting their perspective and trying to see things from their side, it kind of takes the steam out of the argument. Um, and then there's a turning point in that conversation, and that happened in, in the room where they had stopped attacking me, right? And then finally said, well, one of them said, we feel that you just don't respect the years of experience and loyalty that we've given to this organization. And then I stopped and I was like, oh, that's mm. the problem. Wow. Right. Not all the other things they were complaining about. Frankly, 80 percent of the other things that they were complaining about, at least I think I'm being generous, were just total nonsense. Like if I told you what they were now, you'd be like, that's ridiculous. Right. But they were all underpinned by that very valid worry or feeling or concern that I didn't appreciate them, that I didn't respect them. Right. Um, so I said, you know, I can totally see why you would feel that way. I just want to let you know that I do respect you and I've learned so much from you. And, you know, going forward, you know, I'm going to try to do a better job leading this team. And then so I go back to my desk and about 30 minutes later, I get a call from my boss and she calls me into her office and she was like, Joe, what did you say to them? I said, <laughs> why? And she said, because they all came into that room and they were like smiling and they said that was a very productive meeting. <laughs> that's so good joe the thing i love about that is <laughs> you know what i love about that story is you were able to have a really successful outcome in terms of how you led and managed a group of people by listening and i think and the funny thing is i, I you know this is probably part of your reflection i can imagine is you from that point forward you were probably uh, one of the steps I'm imagining that you would have taken is to actually listen better to, because listen communicates respect and listening communicates respect. Sorry. So I find um, that story is just bang on. And, and it's probably the biggest thing that I have struggled with uh, as a younger leader as well is realizing the gravity of how much more effective listening is than talking really most of the time as <laughs> in leadership. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm stealing this from someone I heard um, over the weekend at a leadership conference. Um, the letters in listen are also the letters in silent. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but how often are we truly listening, right? It's like I'm always queuing up my next 
comment or comeback or retort or whatever. Like, how often do I just sort of sit back and say, you know what, let me let me see what this person has to say and, and not try to be smarter or debate them. It's it's actually requires a certain level of self-control and, and humility and maturity to do that. Yeah, that's so good. What, one of my favorite sayings about leadership coaching um, is let the silence do the heavy lifting. And I just love, love that. that picture that, and I think that's for so many leaders too, you know, we probably there's probably something a leader listening knows they need to do some heavy lifting and they've got someone they need to hold them accountable they've got someone they need to really help invest in them to go to another level otherwise they may not make it in their in their role because their performance and it's like okay okay well how can you let the silence do the heavy lifting how can you create time and space with that person where you ask the sort of questions and you give them the sort of time where they're sitting there you're sitting there and there's 10 seconds of silence because they're actually thinking hmm uh, how can I move forward? And, and that's um, that's really what most coaching is. I don't know if you find this, but uh, you know, effective coaching is so much about silence. It's so much about listening and asking great questions that that does the heavy lifting. Yeah, I I love that you brought up the silence, Jono, and and it made me think of of something um, that happens in Aikido where. Um, if you're doing the technique properly and you're in the right position and the person's balanced in a certain way, they, the other person, no matter how big they are, and I've trained with people who are smaller than me and I've trained with people who are like, you know, six something, you know, 300 pounds. Um, but if you're doing it the right way, and, and I'd say in, in coaching and, and leading it, it'd be like, you know, about listening and connecting with the person, the person actually becomes incredibly light and easy to move because they're moving themselves, mm, right? Yeah. You're not, <laughs> That's so you're good. influencing them because you're connected to them, but you're not forcing them to move because the problem with that is if it comes to force, there's always someone bigger than you. There's always someone, you know, yeah. who's heavier than you. Um, if they don't want to move the way you want to move, then you got a big problem. <laughs> and even when you win, you end up bruised and battered because you've engaged in this battle and you've <laughs> defeated them. But you know, there's going to be a round two, right? And watch your back because they're going to be back because no one likes to lose. Yeah. Versus if you're listening and you can kind of position in a way that like you help them see or understand or realize that this is what they should be doing. It, it's like what you were saying. It's almost like you're doing no, no work at all. It's, it's like they, they go where you thought that they should go of their own volition and it becomes very light. Yeah, that's wonderful. I've never thought of it that way. Um, the the other thing that that I find from a similar, I don't know how this would work as a metaphor in uh, in martial arts, but it just popped into my head as you were talking about it. Then I'm always telling leaders that they should leverage their team, and I love the I love the idea of peer to peer accountability and um, using the light heavy sort of idea. Patrick Lencioni talks about this idea that when you're, as a leader, when you're not holding your people accountable, when you won't go there because you're scared, because you are um, you don't want to offend them, because they're a scary person, or maybe their personality, they're more aggressive, uh, you know, naturally at conflict than you are. For some reason, you don't go there. You actually create a heavier mm. load of accountability for yourself. Why? Because the rest of your team look at the situation and they actually go, well, I'm not going to do your dirty work for you. And so you, by not holding people accountable, you actually increase the load of accountability required for you uh, to do, to actually build an effective team. So it's this vicious cycle. Now, the flip side is also true where the more you actually step into small pieces of accountability, where you actually hold people accountable, have those difficult conversations, the amazing thing is your people uh, and, and often your best people will go finally you know Jono's holding them accountable and they'll actually start stepping up and because you're doing it they'll go yeah okay and they'll call someone on their behavior you actually create this team where you have this really powerful dynamic where you're calling each other on behavior and, and that's incredibly challenging to build but the funny thing is the more you do it the lighter the load is that you need to carry because suddenly your team naturally are going to step in for you and uh and it's uh, it's that similar thing where 
if you can actually just take those small steps now around accountability, you end up, and this is what you'll see if you're on a team with a great leader or you see a great leader, there's actually, they're very willing to hold people accountable, but it actually ends up being quite a quite a, a light load. Whereas you go to another leader who really hasn't been doing that and the load that's required of them because the rest of their team's going, uh-uh, I'm not gonna do it. There's a heavy, heavy burden that is, uh, you know, someone like me or someone like you will come in and work with them and go, wow, there's so much here where you're going to need to hold people accountable and yet you haven't been doing any. Um, That idea of heavy and light based on on how you're leading is a really interesting concept. Yeah, I I love that concept and and, and I love uh, Patrick Lencioni's uh, insights and and wisdom. Um, It's kind of interesting, right, Jono, that um, people actually want to be held accountable. Right. As, as long as they believe that yeah. they're safe and that you care about them, it's, you know, I sometimes I hate to use the, the metaphor of children. Right. But mm. like, you know, a, a child wants to be told, you know, what's safe and, and what's good. They don't want their parent just to be totally missing. Right. Like it sounds like a yeah. fantasy, like, yeah, I can do whatever I want, stay up late, eat whatever I want. But that's not actually good for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> like they want direction. They want someone just to be connected. Right. Like even if you're not bossing them around, but just to be like, hey, I'm here. So if you fall, I will see you fall like you won't be sitting there falling for (laughs) for hours and hours with no one paying attention to you. I mean, people want accountability. They want connection um, as long as that trust is there and and they feel like it's coming from a a caring and a a team effort. People want to be held accountable. Yeah, that's that's so true. And. Uh, the other thing with accountability is, you know, the, the great people you want in, on your team, it's like in sport. I love sports. And you see your best your best athletes, your be- not only the best, most talented, but those real team players who when they're in a team, the team tends to win championships. Those sort of players, they will not stay long in a team mm-hmm. that's not winning um, championships. And and the thing is about uh-huh. those, those people is... Uh, and I heard this, I can't remember what, what book it's in. Um, oh, actually, I think it's, uh, it might be in the four disciplines of execution. They talk about this idea of a scoreboard. And, 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 and the thing about accountability is people are desperate to know, am I, like, did we win or did we lose today? And, and it's like, we think, oh, we don't want to tell people that actually they, that was a mistake. Or, but people really want to know, are we winning or losing? Am I winning or losing in my in my job? Because the difference in mentality is they talk about in I think it's four disciplines of execution. It's the difference between going down to the park with your friends and kicking a ball around socially. Think about the intensity of that for for you. You know, you're just kicking a ball around. You get distracted. You you maybe you head home. The other alternative, you know, the alternative is you're with those same people, but you're one nil down in a game of soccer with five minutes to go. Now, all we've done, it's the same people. Uh, We've probably added an opposition that you're playing against, Um, but or maybe you've split into two teams. The point is nothing has changed except now we have a score and a deadline with five minutes to go. And the difference in intensity, for those five minutes, if we're one nil down, I'm going to give my everything to get us over the line. And I love that. uh, I love that story because it's, this is the problem for so many of us as leaders is we need to work out how can we take uh, social kick a ball around in the park culture in our team and how can we in really healthy ways create a, uh, okay, are we one nil down with five minutes to go? Now you're not, you're not always gonna be one nil down with five minutes to go, but you wanna know, people wanna be on that team. They wanna be in that, that that's what people wanna do and that's what people wanna turn up to every day. Um, and, and that's one of the big challenges of leadership. How do you create that sort of feel in a team? Because your best individuals will stay, you'll attract more of them. Um, and, and otherwise, if you can't create that, your greatest people will go, well, I'm out. I'm gonna go down the road to that other place where they are actually winning championships. Yeah, and you know, one thing I love about you using sort of like the sports metaphor is that, you know, it it kind of equalizes things, right? Like people see the results, right? doesn't matter what you look like, what background you're from. If you can kick the ball, dribble it, throw it, catch it, people want you on their team, right? And 
that is just a, a, a really great team dynamic to be part of versus one where it's based on favoritism or we just want people from our side of the tracks on the team or, <laughs> yeah. you know, however things are done or, you know, we only recruit from these schools or whatnot because that's where all the, you know, our previous bosses have come from. Um, but in sports, look, doesn't matter where you're from. If, if you were really good at that sport, everyone's going to be like, come to our school, come to our team. We want you. Um, so I'm, you know, we're, we're starting to sh shift that a little bit in, in corporate, but I still look forward to the days where there's more of that versus an us versus them attitude, you know, sort of the entrenched kind of silos of, you know, what, what's, what, you know, what is, a, a the right type of person we hire for our culture and fit versus, Hey, if you can do the job, if you're amazing, we want you on our team. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's, um, and I don't think there's many things in life that, that are, are richer experiences than being part of a, an amazing team, whether you're the most skilled or the least skilled, whether you're the oldest or the youngest, uh, there's something about being on a team where everyone is accepted and belongs, but where there's a high performance culture and you're actually challenging each other, but, yeah. but have each other's backs as well. That is there aren't many things in life more rewarding than being on a team like that. It certainly makes coming to work a, a hundred times better than being part of um, a team that it doesn't have that culture. Yeah. And you, you surprise yourself how much you can actually accomplish and, and you grow so much. I agree. Well, this is too much fun, but I do want to jump into leadership express because I've got a few questions for you, uh, which I think you'll have some great answers for. So are you ready, Joe? Yeah, sure. Okay, first of all, what's a book that you've gifted to other people? Um, the Untethered Soul. Anytime anyone asks me about a, a good book to read, that's near the top of my list. Just uh, so much wisdom in there and has really kind of helped me understand myself and my limitations so much better. Oh, I love it. Do you know the author? Uh, Michael Singer. Michael Singer, The Untethered Soul. Wonderful. Great recommendation. Thank you. Uh, right now, are there any books you're currently reading? Any podcasts you're loving right now? Any blogs you're reading? Um, one of the podcasts I'd say I get a lot of, uh, two podcasts I get a ton of inspiration from. Um, one is On Being with Krista Tippett. Um, she's just an amazing interviewer. Um, it's not a religious show, but she has a very sort of spiritual, philosophical bent um, to all her interviews. And the other one is called The Hidden Brain. Um, and it's just right up my alley where it's, you know, psychological studies and research, but like applied to human relationships and, and human performance. And just uh, I get such a great charge at listening to uh, either of those podcasts. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for those recommendations. Do you have any favorite questions that you ask uh, as part of your work at KPMG when you're working with the client in your own work coaching? Are there any questions that are Joe's go-to questions? I mean, the main one is, is such a simple one, which is um, what are we trying to accomplish here, right? So, I mean, how often do we go into these meetings where you talk around when to have the next meeting or... <laughs> all manner of things when really just one thing needs to get done. So just to be able to focus on like, what are we actually trying to do right now? Uh, I, I think always helps cut to the chase. Yeah, that's great. And it's also, it's, it's, uh, I feel like it's a really key part of coaching that, um, I love how simple effective coaching is. People think it's, uh, it's such a, uh, I, I guess it is a mixture of art and science. Um, but I, I love, how profound it is to really narrow down for someone. One of the things I do in a coaching session is really help someone articulate. I love to ask people, what's what's keeping you up at night? Like, what's what are you literally losing sleep over uh, for, for leaders? And then sometimes <laughs> they say, well, nothing. I go, great. But the number of times people say, well, I've had people say, well, literally this morning at 2 a.m., I woke up because I was thinking about oh, this person that I, I don't know how to deal with it. I'm really worried because... You know, it's they've missed two months of their of their numbers, but we're also friends, and I, it's really tricky. You know, so um, asking, so, but whether it's that question or another question, just framing a focus, even in a session, 
which I think a lot of leaders could do in one-on-ones is really trying to nail down what are we mm-hmm. what are we trying to achieve in this one in this one-on-one or even just saying to the to the person if you've got someone on your team and you you have some space with them you go out for coffee just say you know what we've got an hour together what would you love to you know achieve what can I help with by the end of this hour what would be the best thing for you to to know to have worked on together for me to help you with and uh, just clarifying that sometimes can even help the other person who might have thought oh I don't know and they'll come up with something and say actually this is the biggest roadblock for me and you work on that together and um, and that can be really really helpful so I love that that question in in many contexts that's a good one Joe thanks what about uh, what's a commonly held belief in leadership that you passionately disagree with? Commonly held belief that I passionately disagree with. Um, you know, it's it's funny that you asked that question because uh, I was just finishing up the script um, to a course I've been trying to create, um, and I end the script actually talking about something like that where. What you hear a lot from um, underrepresented professionals, and you know, I'm, I'm Asian by ethnicity, uh, is that you have to hold yourself to a higher standard than others, right? Because your chances and maybe you know your ability to make mistakes could be less than other people because you may be considered as an anomaly or not part of the group, and. There is a certain wisdom in that or practicality in that. I get it. But it's a very damaging kind of advice because it causes um, resentment because now you feel you're being treated unfairly and it causes burnout and other bad behaviors where you have to release that sort of stress and stigma by, you know, external activities or substances, right? And and maybe your family or loved ones get get the brunt of that. So what I like to tell people is why is it that some people get an easier pass than you, right? Mm. Um, And the reason is, and and it's not like a race thing necessarily, it's, it's a group thing. It's like a club thing. It's a connection thing. And the reason is because certain people are born into a club just naturally, right? And I'm not born into that club just because of the way I look, right? But it doesn't mean I can't be in the club. It just means I'm not in the club automatically. So my answer is, you know, instead of working on being better than everyone else, spend some time actually connecting with people and being part of the same group. So when things do go wrong, because we're all going to mess up, right? You have just as many or more people on your side rooting for you. Um, And I feel like we've kind of reached a point in our society in our time where this sort of advice I'm giving is actually doable or more practical, right? Where in the past, you know, societally, it it may not have really gotten you very far. Um, But I think, you know, there is much more opportunity for you to use that connection piece rather than just trying to never mess up, right? Can you imagine the stress Mm. of just knowing that the next time you mess up, (laughs) you're going to be shown the door? I mean, what kind of sort of career or life is that where you're constantly like, you know, checking your back uh, for someone waiting for you to mess up? I mean, I do not want to advise people to live their career uh, in that manner if they can help it. I agree. Uh, That's uh, that's great advice. Great thoughts. Okay, uh, two more questions. What is a movie or TV sure. show that really impacted you? Could be a serious one where it's it's stayed with you, or it could be a switch off favorite show that you love to watch to, to relax. I, I'll take either. Ah, well, um, favorite movie of all time, just for fun, is The Princess Bride. I mean, there's just not a bad scene in that movie. <laughs> Very quotable yeah. um, and inconceivable. Uh, you know, from a, yeah, inconceivable, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and from a kind of a, a, a interest perspective, um, really enjoyed the Breaking Bad series. Yeah, um, so well done. And one thing I found kind of interesting about it is this transformation of Walter White. Yeah, from this 
mild mannered chemistry teacher who can't even quit his own job to <laughs> Heisenberg, yeah. right? Yeah. To the drug kin kingpin. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that was always inside him. Yeah. Right? But he had to make that choice and say, you know what? I am Heisenberg. I'm not Walter White anymore. And it's and not that we should all become drug kingpins, but <laughs> it just goes to illustrate that, you know, who we choose to be has an outsized effect on who we actually become. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good, Joe. And they nail the journey of that, don't they? You really feel like you watch this oh, yeah. man wrestle and change in a very life lifelike, you know, very realistic way. I'm not in danger, Jono. I am the danger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of, I love uh, I love the series The Sopranos for a similar reason or the Godfather movies because um even though it's less yeah. you know or the Godfather is a bit like that too with Michael Corleone, but it's the The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. I love the the tension. I feel like so often our characters in movies and TV shows we like it when people are black and you know black or white, one dimensional we just know yeah. know what they're going to do and how they're going to react, but they they just do so well in those shows and movies to show these people who are conflicted. They have this passion for their family, and there's something in them that wants to do the right yeah. thing, and yet this 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 passion and greed for uh, for wealth, uh, you know, and they're they're consistently at crossroads. Um, and I just find that, yeah, and you're right, it is about choosing. I had someone on the podcast recently really say something profound. She came from, uh, it's, it's an episode with Rocky Howard, and she has an amazing story that she shares, a really challenging upbringing um, with, uh, with abuse, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's, it's just a very profound episode, but she talked about how one of the things that when I asked her, okay, how did you turn out? Well, like you, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, you know? Yeah. And yet you are, you are, you're like, she's just such a wonderful person, uh, mother, wife, incredible uh, leader, um, chief people and diversity officer, yeah. but also communicator and has her own podcast. And I'm like, how are you, you after going through that? And she said, I, I just, I choose every day. And I thought that was such a simple but profound yeah. answer to say she's just, ever since she was younger, she's chosen every day, you know, well, this is what I'm going to move towards. And I was like, wow, that's, that's not what I expected, but there's so much truth in that. I love that. I love it. <laughs> Last question for you, Joe. Uh, if you could only give one piece yep. of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? I would say that all the most interesting things you're going to do, all the best opportunities you're going to get, they're not going to happen at your desk. I mean, I have done this and I've seen so many people do this. You're chained to your desk, trying to get all these tasks and things done, checking your email, trying to inbox zero or whatever. Um, the best opportunities I've ever had have been because I went to a conference and hung out with some coworkers who later hired me into their team. I <laughs> talked to someone that I didn't know at lunch who later asked me to present at some sort of training they were doing. These were all things that happened while, while I'm not at my desk. And if I had just sat at my desk the whole time, I can guarantee you I'd be a lot further behind than I am now. Yeah, that's so good. And the only thing I'd add to that as well is Get away from your desk and just try to help some people at work and outside of work. Yeah. Even like I, lo I love uh, yeah, sort of yeah. what you do as on the side of KPMG as well, the, the awesome things you're doing as the connection counselor. I think um, people should, you know, it doesn't have to be rocket science as well. Who Who is there in your world right now that you could help? Do you have a friend who is starting a business and you know something about marketing because that's the work you're in? Well, you know, how can you lend them a hand? Like just even if it's sort of two people connected from you, I just find that if you will just jump in and, and, and help people and worry about the strategy of it later, just go and help some people, get away from your desk, go and help some people. And I feel like it always comes back around. You know, there's, 
and and you don't you don't it's not that you do it for that reason but i don't think there's anything wrong with going you know what my approach to life it's that zig ziglar quote if you want to um you know you, you end up getting everything you want if you'll just actually go and, and help others get what they want yeah well Jono, uh thank you for all you do it's been truly a pleasure uh, talking to you and, and hearing your insights and, and perspective as well. And um, I'm really thankful that you uh, invited me on the show to be able to share and have this conversation with you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just for people who want to find you, where can they find you online? Yeah. Um, best place is uh, on my website, www.connectioncounselor.com. Um, I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, and the three things I have going right now for those who are interested is I have a daily podcast called Executive Presence Morsels uh, every weekday, 7 a.m. Eastern, 5 to 10 minutes. Uh, I have a weekly video leadership series um, called Executive Tune-Up, um, so you can sign up to that um, on LinkedIn as a newsletter. And then I've just started in 2022 a monthly uh, free workshop series where I tackle a different challenging um, topic every month. And uh, in March 31st, we're going to have one on um, how to come out from someone else's shadow, right? A lot of people are number two or number three, uh, make their boss look good, but how do you come out from that while still doing your job? And I affectionately call it, uh, nobody puts baby in a corner. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. Uh, well, thank you so much, Joe. It's uh, been a pleasure to have you on the podcast and uh, can't wait for people to listen to this. I know it's going to help a lot of them. Thanks, Chano. I hope you have a wonderful 2022. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much 
that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.